is a senior lecturer from UAW. She's a senior lecturer in science education and the head of Department of Basic Education of the University. She holds a PhD in science education from the same university. She's worked on teacher education in the Sub-Saharan Africa Initiative where open educational resources are used to improve teacher quality across the region. She also works with the Ghana Institute for the Future of Teaching and Education, Gifted, a collaboration between New York University, University of Education, Winneba, and University of Minnesota. She has several publications in reputable international journals and a reviewer for International Journal of Basic Education research and policy. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Dr. Sakina Akwe for her presentation. Mr. Chairperson, um, representative from the Ministry of Education, my dear Professor, Professor Anamwa Mensa, Mr. Todd from TTEL, professors here present, fellow lecturers and tutors, Ladies and gentlemen, all protocol duly observed. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to do this presentation. Once again, my name is Sakina Akwa. And like was earlier said, I'm presenting on the more the merrier, an assessment of the effect of small group discussion technique on student social interactions in the implementation of the new BEAD curriculum. This presentation has been put together by Mrs. Vivian Aqua, Mrs. Vivian Aqui, sorry, because I always call her Aqua, Dr. Richardson Ade Mununkrum, and then Dr. Eric Ananga, all of the University of Education, Winneba. This is going to be the outline of my presentation. So we we'll look at the introduction and background, we are looking at the need to explore the efficacy of some of the um, cross-cutting issues in the curriculum. We are looking at overarching questions and then the methodology, findings, conclusions, and then implication for implementation. I would like us to watch a brief video to tell us the states of teaching in basic schools and whether we are happy with it. Okay, that is 
from what we just watched. The video talks about the current state of teaching in our basic schools. What is right? We are going to look at what is right about what we saw. What needs changing? And then what are we as a nation doing to bring about the change? So what we saw, we saw an enthusiastic teacher. Obviously, he's learned his content. He's learned some methodology. And what he learned is based on what we have taught him, lecturers and tutors inclusive. So he's, he's just replicating us in the classroom. He's teaching how he has been taught. There's no two ways about that and you could see how he's just teaching without considering the pupils that he's teaching all the attention was talking with few engagement with the pupils now we want to look at what is wrong you could see somebody obviously not interested. And if you watch the video well, you could see that most of the pupils, unless they were prompted, they were doing something of their own because they have not been engaged in what is going on. The teacher failed at a point in time to engage the pupils due to the poor quality of teaching. However, at this level, we must make lessons practical and hands-on. It must be engaging for learners so that they can achieve the greatest benefit. But this is often not the case. And this is leading to poor quality of teaching and poor academic achievement of pupils. So, what are we doing? How are we going to fix this problem we have identified? There has been the development of, at the national level, to address the challenges associated with teacher quality. The national teacher standards has come at a point or at the right time to set the bar for minimum proficiency standards for entry level teachers. The National Teacher Education Curriculum Framework is providing a comprehensive structure within which all teacher education curricula should operate. So we have the NPEV having four basic pillars. And these basic pillars are grounded in what we call the cross-cutting issues. And because of our study, we are going to focus on core and transferable skills. That's where our, our focus was. And when we put all these things together and ensure that they are effectively implemented, we are going to train effective, engaging, and inspiring teachers who are fully prepared to teach the basic school curriculum to improve the learning outcomes and life chances for all learners.
what are these core and transferable skills? They are critical thinking, problem solving, creative thinking, communication, once again, social and collaborative skills. It is highlighted because it's also where we are focusing our study. And then commitment to lifelong learning. And these skills are 21st century skills that are sought after globally. Our teacher education programs have placed much emphasis on content and content knowledge without showing how the soft skills we have identified here define the professionalism of the teacher and how it is cultivated through initial teacher training pedagogy. So our interest now is to find out how social and collaborative skills bring a communal effect to all the other core and transferable skills to make teacher education effective. So social and collaborative skills, research shows that it's a means of encouraging or they are means of encouraging learning mechanisms like induction, deduction, and associative learning. They are learned through engagement and practice, and this is what we saw lacking in the video, and obviously lacking in our teaching. How we engage and make our lessons practical. Then these skills also influence students' learning and knowledge retention. It helps or they help effective division of labor, which promotes refined perspectives and enhance creativity. So totally we are saying that social and collaborative skills are key to the success of the new curriculum. Hence steps were taken to help student teachers acquire them. And where were they where, where did we implement the study? So we go back to what UUW is doing about the new curriculum. UEW, that is the University of Education with the, is the only 100% teacher training or teacher education university in Ghana. For this status, UEW is committed to teacher quality and has invested heavily in improving teacher preparation programs run by the university. As such, when the opportunity came for the new curriculum to be de developed, UEW was ready. And it has made a strong representation of about 70% experts in the writing of the new curriculum. Currently, a, an equally large number of UEW lecturers are involved in the writing of the models for implementation. At UEW, what did we do? or who, which groups were involved. At the Faculty of Educational Studies, there are two departments, and these are the departments of basic education and the department of early childhood education. So these two departments have been involved in the initial trial. And after trying it for almost a semester, we taxed ourselves to assess how poised the curriculum is in the preparation and equipping of the 21st century teacher. What did we do? Although a new curriculum, we as a faculty are interested in its success. Hence, we deemed it necessary to assess the rollout right from the beginning. And this presentation is part of a larger study that assess the implementation of the new BEAD curriculum at UEW. So on what we did, we looked at the fact that fewer studies have been conducted within UEW context to assess the efficacy of techniques used in lesson delivery. A lot of the studies have concentrated on maybe pedagogic content knowledge, pedagogy content knowledge, but fewer studies have looked at the efficacy of teaching techniques used. So we focus on the efficacy of teaching techniques used in lesson delivery. And the purpose was to explore the efficacy of using small group techniques as a teaching technique to help students acquire the social and collaborative skills we are talking about. And to guide this study was this research question. What is the effect? 
effect of small group discussion technique on pre-service teachers' acquisition of social and collaborative skills. How did we do it? This research is purely a quantitative research and we use a descriptive survey design. Sampling was based on sensors and we sampled 306 pre-service teachers. Instrument used were close a close-ended questionnaire on a five-point like a scale, and the analysis were based on descriptive statistics. What did we find? Students' relationship with group members. The study revealed that 72% liked working in groups. Students showed that they, they liked working in groups. And then 77% were able to clarify questions and answers well during group discussion. Also, 82% got deeper level understanding when explaining issues in groups. Further, 73% think group, groups achieve success when looking for information. And then 78 agreed that their sitting arrangement facilitated group work. Let me say a little on this. For this to be done, we, we went the extra mile, looking at the uh, lecture system and then space for teaching. We have to use the evenings or any available time. So lecturers involved really have to teach sometimes throughout the whole day and throughout the whole week for this to be achieved because space is a little of a challenge. Other issues that came up, we realized that 93% said they made new friends through working in groups. However, only 30 This shows that during the group work, they were focusing on what they came to do, not on other things. Discussion. The findings are consistent with scholarship. Based on the earlier, realize that all able to start using group work then they will be able to model it when they go to the field to teach so group work is very effective it really works and for group work to be effective certain arrangement is key so we need to develop all the forms of certain arrangement in the class to make teaching effective and looking at a certain arrangement something else comes up now we want to look at the challenges that we encountered the first challenge is large class size with fewer i don't know if fewer tutors or fewer lectures but fewer lectures was identified so like i said earlier we had to put the students in groups i am the one teaching that's my class and this is three times what a level. So I've put the class into three groups. This is one group. And this is the biggest lecture room I have to do this teaching. So for this work to be possible, I had to use the evenings, other times that were available. So everybody involved in this implementation had to stretch him or herself for this to be possible. And we are looking at this for only the trial. 
Next semester, when we have level 200 or new level 100s and moving on to level 200, then we're going to have two groups. And the staff, student staff ratio of that department is very high. We have 981 pupils to one lecture, which is very, very high. The normal is 200 students to one lecturer. So if you're going to use this, which we did, we really stretched ourselves. So it is something that we have to look at. If group work in the implementation of the new curriculum is going to be very, very effective, we have to look at how we are going to have smaller class sizes and then how we are going to have even the space for the implementation. Then we also had the issue of physical infrastructure and then also resources. So we, we are um, making it known that for this group work to be effective, all these things should be considered. And whoever can provide us with resources should do it. What I'm saying is that this technique works. It helps students to learn. You don't have to force them to do something. Once they are in the group, they are able to find information for themselves. You just go around giving help here and there. But at the end of the day, they will produce the results that you are expecting of them. So it is something that we should do. The curriculum is workable. We should push it. Other implications for implementation. The national teaching standard has high expectation for the 21st century teacher. Therefore, we need to drum this home with our student teachers at the start of their program. Whatever it takes for student teachers to be sensitized should be done so that they will be able to use it. Then we come to attitudinal change and full commitment required from lecturers and tutors. This shouldn't be a nine-day wonder issue. What we are saying is that the curriculum has the potential to change our story. The curriculum has a way of improving what we as tutors or lecturers do in the classroom. And once we are able to get it, our pupils, will, our students will get it because teachers will teach the way they are taught. So if you are going to use this, I can say that it's going to work. So we should change our attitude towards new things. We can't expect any different results when you are doing the same things over and over and over again. So we should just move to this curriculum, give it a try, and I tell you that we are going to see results. Then we need regular, continuous professional development. It shouldn't be like we are tired of every, I don't know how it is done in the colleges, every Wednesday or every Thursday they are calling us for this. No innovation works without continuous professional development. Without it, it doesn't work. So we should be prepared for continuous professional development. It will expose us to what is in the curriculum. It will teach us how to use it. And when we use it, we will testify that issues have changed. Then we also need, and on that, and on that, I, I want to draw, I don't know if it's detail or at, attention to the fact that UEW is going to uh, partner some colleges of edu education, and we have the highest number of colleges of education. So I find it unfortunate that no professional development has been given to Department of Basic Education and Department of Early Childhood who are going to partner the Colleges of Education. So I think it's high, high time we also look at us concerning professional education so that we'll be able to do it. I'm telling you that a lot of people, even in the university, have a certain attitude. So if you're not exposed to it, it will be difficult for us to use it. So turn your attention to us too. Then, institutional leadership support is very critical. Without leadership support, no innovation will be successful. So, whoever the leaders are, at the ministry level, at the national level, at the college level, 
even at your own level as a leader, you should ensure that this works. You put in your maximum effort to ensure that this curriculum works. I think our story should change. If we are the gateway, we should be the gateway of even education. In the sub-region, when they mention Ghana, it should be a different story. And I can say that this curriculum has the potential of doing that. In conclusion, we say that social and collaborative skills are very necessary for the implementation of the new BEAD curriculum as they make the training of the 21st century teacher feasible. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Akwa. Let's clap for her again. Yeah, I'm glad our tutors came with us and they will be interested in what they've just heard. Can we take just two questions, please? Two questions, if any. This one at the back. Thank you very much, Doc, for the presentation. My concern is that from your presentation, it seems that currently we have large classes, lack of resources. So in the absence of these resources, we are using the lecture method. And then you conduct a study that says that we should go for the smaller groups. And I'm wondering how you conduct a study and all your findings are in line with earlier findings. Was there no contradiction that, for example, didn't you come out with any or come across any information that says that in the absence of lecturers or resources, the lecture method is the best? How come your findings, you know, is, your, your findings are in line with all the earlier researches. Okay, thank you very much for your question. I have my team members to help me. Um, thank you very much for your question. Actually, what we did was to divide the whole group into smaller groups. So that huge number that you saw there were divided into groups of 10 in order for the study to be successful. So the lecturers had to go the extra mile to put the students in the desired settings. And that's why we got those um, results. But if we had worked with the group as they, you saw them, you see that the results would have been different. So the lecturers had to go the extra mile, divide the groups into 10. In fact, we were having just divide 520 into groups of 10 and we are supposed to meet, meet each one of them at least once in a week. It wasn't an easy thing. So we had to work very hard to get that results. Thank you. Like we said, we wanted to find out how the thing will work. We just wanted to find out how feasible the whole curriculum is. That is why we put ourselves to do that. We were not expecting good results. It wasn't like we needed good results, so we wanted to find out how. We, we are going to partner other colleges, so we wanted to find out what are the things that we have to handle. Fortunately for us, this is the result we had. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, mine is also similar to the earlier question. Um, we know that in group work, uh, there is something else we call uh, social loafing. Uh, so I don't know if there has been the assumption in your case that there won't be any social loafing and it's all synergy. And uh, so if it's so, then probably we are proceeding on a wrong assumption. Thank you. Um, as as uh, my colleague rightly hinted, uh, this is work in progress. It's not finished yet. We just felt that these were interesting findings that we could share. And so we wouldn't want to say that we know it all about this one. And we are, we are happy to take 
uh, work back and then begin to look at some of these contradictions as we move along. But for now, these are results that we felt were happy, happy findings that we needed to share to motivate us as we move into the new curriculum. All right, so let's thank Dr. Akwa and her team. Thank you so much for your presentation. All right, I think we'll move on to our next item on the... The Chief Director will give us his address. Let me start by bringing you the special greetings from the Minister of Education, who would actually love to be here, but he is out of the jurisdiction. That is why I'm standing in for him. Vice Chancellors and Faculty of Education leads, civil society organizations, Directors of Ministry of Education and Ghana Education Service, heads of agencies, Tita Ghana National Program Manager, principals of colleges of education, regional directors of education, key education stakeholders, teachers, teacher education unions, development partners, our friends from the media, ladies and gentlemen, may I take this opportunity to welcome, to warmly welcome you to the second learning summit, an important engagement for the teacher education sector to deliberate on improving and expanding learning in our colleges of education. Today, we are refreshing a commitment that we made during the first summit back in 2017, and sharing key findings from research conducted by colleagues that is shaping the delivery of BA, of BA curriculum and its sustainability. The summit is of great significance because our coming together today signifies how teaching and learning is indispensable in the education and development of our nation. I wish to thank NCT and TITA for recognizing the need for us to come together and for organizing this forum for constructive deliberations and to push the reform agenda in our colleges forward. Ladies and gentlemen, with education, every individual has the opportunity to become anything they want. It is education that can make the son of a cleaner, the boss of the same company his parent cleans. If education is that powerful, then the approach to its delivery must follow suit. The Ministry of Education acknowledges that a key function of modern education, of modern education curricula is to inspire the minds of Ghana's children and equip them with both the knowledge and the skills necessary to ensure Ghana's continuous development. 
Sins Teacher. Sins Teacher program launched five years ago. You have all been working side by side to not only strengthen teacher education in colleges of education, but also to facilitate the design of policy frameworks which are creating an environment that enables such changes to have longer term success, including codes of professional conduct for teachers in Ghana. As we will hear throughout the day, through this collaboration, you are creating change that is having a positive impact on those studying to become teachers, those who are educating our teachers, and perhaps most importantly, all those who enter the classroom to learn. However, what we will hear today should also remind us that we have an ambitious goal, and to achieve this ambition requires consistent and continuous efforts. We must continue to ensure that evidence on what is working and what needs improvement from colleges across the country deepens our understanding of the B.Ed. implementation and guides us as we strengthen and sustain these reforms. Ladies and gentlemen, these educational reforms are continuous. We therefore must understand the importance of this evidence, which not only creates change in our educational system, but also gives insight into why this has to be done and why it's important. So let us all enjoy learning and sharing ideas from all the great minds gathered here. From hearing about how colleagues are gathering and using evidence to strengthen teaching and learning to ways forward in fostering gender responsive and more inclusive education. But in the days that follow, let us ensure that we hear, let us ensure that what we hear today is shared with colleagues and informs the work we are doing in our colleges, in our agencies, and in our collaborations as we move forward with our common goal to ensure the next generation are inspired, motivated, and have the greatest possible opportunity to achieve success. Education, ladies and gentlemen, lays the foundation to a better future. If we truly wish to sustain the changes the teacher education sector has worked tirelessly towards over the past five years, and particularly over the past 12 months, we need the evidence and thinking from today to re-energize us for these critical months ahead. I wish that this summit will cultivate ideas and recommendations that will bear the fruit of excellence in teaching and learning within the colleges of education and in learning outcomes in classrooms across the country. We are transforming teaching to transform learning. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Chief Director. Yeah, colleagues, we, we have a photograph session outside. So we'll step up and then we'll do it inside. Oh, okay. So, Enoch will assist me to do that. Thank you very much. Okay. 
Thank you. So before we go into the power sessions, we'll have um, a photograph session. Can we please have all the presenters? We want to please have all the members on the high table come in front. Um, our photographer will help with arrangements. So members on the high table, can we please come forward? Then can we please have the presenters, the various presenters, can you join us? Do they come up? Yeah, you can come in front. So they come up. Yeah, please come up. Robin, can you please join them? Presenters, can we also have the chairs, the various session chairs? Thank you very much. Next, Prinkoff, Principals of Colleges of Education, can you please come up? Oh. Members on the high table, please stay.
the progress that uh, uh, TTEL has made over the years in terms of the uh, uh, innovations that have been introduced into the colleges of education. And we want, we have done already the baseline, the midline, and today we're going to listen to the end line results. And we have one of the researchers who undertook this research, Yahaya Nkrumah, who is going to uh, help us understand the, uh, uh, the results of the final end line analysis. So, uh, without much ado, I'm just going to call on Yahaya to make his presentation to us. He has 30 minutes and uh, it starts from now. Now. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, um, good morning, everyone. Um, once again, my name is Nkroma Yaya Ahmed from GMK Consulting. Um, in 2015, GMK Consulting uh, won a bid to conduct a baseline assessment for the TITEL program. The main essence of the baseline study was to establish the situation on the ground before TITEL implemented its interventions. By so doing, TITEL would be able to measure the impact of the interventions they are putting in place in the various colleges. And then after two years, which is in 2017, we also conducted the midline assessment. By the time we conducted the midline assessment, TITEL had already started implementing some projects in the various colleges of education. And so we were able to measure the progress they had made as of 2017. And then in 2018, that is last year, we conducted the end line assessment. So with the end line assessment, we were able to evaluate whether TITEL was able to achieve its objectives, its targets. So the format of the presentation is going to be in the form, we will have the baseline results, we'll have the midline results, we'll have the end line results, and we'll also have the target that was set by TITEL. And so they will be able to see the various progress they made over the project, over the project period and then we'll be able to tell whether we're able to achieve the targets or not. Uh, I'm told I have 20 minutes, so we'll have to go in quickly. Um, basically, so the format is that we are going to go through the sampling methodology that we used, the College of Education tutor findings, the mentor-mentee findings, the College of Education principal findings, and then the beginning teacher findings. In summary, the indicators that were evaluated in the study were output indicators and outcome indicators. So basically for the output indicators, we're able to measure the various interventions that we are putting in place. And the outcome is the overall objective for which we are, uh, we are implementing the study. So for this study that we did, for the tutors, the principals, and the mentors and mentees, what we did was that um, their indicators were output indicators. But ultimately, beginning teachers, for this context, beginning teachers are teachers who have completed the College of Education and have been posted to their first schools to go and teach. Ultimately, they are the target. Because at the end, we want to make sure that they have all the requisite skills and expertise to teach their children. So when you look at the sampling that we we used for at the time we had the 40 colleges of education you know currently we have six additional colleges so for the assessment that we did the six additional colleges were not part so we interviewed uh, the principals of the college of education their secretaries and quality assurance officers we that is 40 all of we interviewed all of them and we also sampled 293 college of education tutors and then 2,930 student teachers. So for the 2,930, what we did was that for each tutor that we either observed or interviewed, we selected 10 students from his class. And then we conducted interview with the 10 students in response to what the tutor had said. So for the beginning teachers, we also um, interviewed 408 sample. 
and then 4,080 pupil, which means for, for the beginning teachers also, for each teacher, we interviewed um, 10 pupils. So for the interview we did with the pupil, it wasn't a one-on-one -on -one interview because they are quite young. We used uh, an approach called a sleeping game. So for the sleeping game approach, it wasn't a sleeping competition per se. What we did was that um, we asked, we sampled the students, the pupil from the class, we isolate them in a different class. We assure them of confidentiality. We also make sure that um, uh, the beginning teacher is not in the classroom. So what we, we ask them to do is that they put their head on the desk so that no one sees the other. So we ask them a question. If they agree to it, if they say yes, they raise up their hand without looking at anyone. If it is no, your hand stays by your side. So for example, some of the questions we asked them was that, and when your teacher is teaching in class, does he prefer to call more boys than girls when he, when he asks questions? So if, you, if they believe that is what the, the beginning teacher does, they raise up their hands, or otherwise their hand, their hand uh, you know, remains on their side. So basically that is the approach we use. And for the mentors and the mentees, usually when the students get, in the colleges get to year three, they are assigned mentors who help them with their teaching practice. So we interviewed one mentor, and then the mentee is also interviewed. So we had 410 mentors, 410 mentees, all across the baseline, midline, and then end line. This was the format we used, the same sample size. But we didn't interview the same people because we assured them of confidentiality. So we randomly sampled from them. So for the colleges, apart from interviewing all the principals, what we did was that we sampled 20 colleges out of the 40. So it's with these 20 colleges that we interviewed the tutors for the assessment. So we will go through the first, we'll go through the output indicators first, and then the outcome indicators will be last. So we we'll start with the tutors. With the tutors, the first indicator measured the percentage of English, mathematics, and science, male and female tutors using detailed teaching and learning materials for lessons and tutorials. This was the indicator. So if you, if you look at the indicator, the terms of reference for the study was focused on English, mathematics, and science tutors only. So if you have other teachers teaching other subjects, they were excluded in this study. So the, the specifically, we looked at detailed uh, materials, whether they are used to plan lessons, whether, whether they are used to teach lessons, and whether the students use them. If you look at the findings, we, we've, broken them, we've broken them down into English, mathematics, and science, male and then female. So we realized that at baseline, obviously, no one was using detail teaching and learning materials. So we have zero throughout. But midline, at midline, Titel had given all the materials to the colleges. And so we see that for male English, we have at midline 50.8% of male using the material, female 58.8, and then mathematics 54.2 for male, and then 43.8 for female, and then for science 57.8, and then 50%. At end line, we realized that for the English male and female, we had those using the materials 46% and 46.6. Mathematics 51.3, 50%, and then the science 49.4, 35.3. So we realize that we've highlighted the end line. Some of them are green, and the other has a shade of red. The one that has a shade of red means that the end line target was not achieved. So if you look at the end line target, English, male and female, 49% and 50%. Mathematics, 45% and 44%. So we realize that for mathematics, both male and female uh, mathematics tutors were able to achieve the, the target. And for science also, the males were able to achieve their target, but the females were not able to achieve their target. So the second indicator was a percentage of English, mathematics, and science, male and female tutors, demonstrating student-centered teaching methods. So the various components that we looked at include use of different interactive methods, range of questions, promote a teacher, a tutor who promotes whole group discussion, group pair work, use of assessment strategies, gives constructive feedback, use of strategies for mixed abilities, use of leadership for learning strategies. So these were the various components that we looked at. And for this also, for the tutors, we had two forms. We had classroom observation, 
apart from classroom observations, we did KI, key informant interviews with them. So for the classroom observations, we had uh, circuit supervisors who were trained over a period of four days to be able to do this assessment for the colleges. So if we look at the findings here, we realize that at baseline, even before TITEL started implementing its interventions, 23.3% English male, 36.7% for female, and for mathematics, 28.6, 22.2, for science, 26.0, and 5.9 for female for science. You realize that at midline, there was a significant increase in the, in the proportion of tutors who were demonstrating student-focused teaching methods. 67.8, 61.8, 62.7, 75.0 .7, for mathematics, 66.3, 72.2% for science. So at end line, we still see a progression in terms of the achievement of the indicator. So if you look at the indicator in the end line, all of them are green, which means that for this indicator, TTEL was able to achieve all its targets. So the targets were 63, 63% for English, 58 and 66% for mass, 59% for, for science, for both male and female. So if we look at the last, in the, the last output indicator for the tutors, we're looking at percentage of English, mathematics, and science male and female tutors demonstrating gender sensitive instructional methods. Specifically, what we're looking at was the extent of equal treatment of female and male students with regards to questions, discussion, participation, encouragement, uh, classroom leadership, etc. And also the use of gender responsive with regards to um, uh, challenging traditional gender roles in teaching and learning materials and activities. So for this indicator also, we realized that at baseline, almost all, we, we had an average about 10% or less of tutors demonstrating uh, gender sensitive instructional methods. At midline, there was a significant increase to 45.8, 44.1, 48 50, 45.8, 55.6. And at end line, we still see a progression. So for the target, uh, it's only English female and the math female who are not able to attain the target, but all other uh, groups were able to attain the end line target. So after we come to uh, mentor and mentee findings, so for the for male and 2.0% for female at midline, there was an increase, but it was not significant. So we see 12.2% for male, 10.7% for female, and overall 11.5. And then at end line, we still see a slight increase, but these increases are not significant. So the end line target of 30% for both male and female were not uh, achieved for this indicator. So for the mental indicator, it was just one. Output indicator was just one. So we go to the College of Education principal findings. So for the principals also, we're looking at principals who demonstrate a percentage achievement of a defined set of leadership and management skills. Specifically, whether the colleges have vision and mission statement and whether they are aligned, the level of stakeholder involvement in the development of these statements, whether objectives have been developed from the visions, use of vision to inform uh, college development plans, and college principals' understanding of the statutory roles and responsibilities of the governing council, and then whether they are set up and level the functionality of committees of governing council and academic board. For this indicator also, we see that at baseline, 29.6% for male principals, 45.5% for female principals. At midline, we see a progression. 64.5% were able to uh, demonstrate this, their leadership skills, and then 55.6 for female. And at the end line, we still see a significant improvement. 86.2% for male principals, 72.7% for female principals. So if you look at the target that was set by TITEL, the principals, they were able to achieve it in excess. And for the female, we see 72.7. We know we can approximate it to 73% if you want to run it to the nearest whole number. But we, are, we have to leave it this way. So it's... Uh, you can say the target was achieved, though. Okay. So for the second indicator, principal or colleges meeting 
50% of their annual targets, including gender-related targets within college improvement plans. So for this component, the various levels we are looking at was gender planning, financial management targets, teaching and learning targets, partnership and cooperation, infrastructure and environment, and then student engagement. So for this indicator also, at baseline, none of the colleges were able to uh, score anything. They had zero at baseline. And at midline, we had 7.5% of colleges uh, meeting or achieving 50% of the annual target. And then at the end line, we had 20% of colleges being able to achieve 50% of the annual target. So the end line target was 26. So we realized that um, at the end line was close, but we were not able to achieve this. And about the last indicator was percentage of colleges with a defined set of management policies demonstrating a defined set of gender sensitive criteria. So for the policies, we have, I think, about 14, uh, 14 uh, policies, staff recruitment, sexual harassment, quality assurance policy, acceptable use policy, teaching and learning policy, inclusion and gender policy, health and safety policy, tutor code of conduct, admission, and so on and so forth. So when we look at the specifics, the percentage of policies that were adopted at baseline, excuse me, you want to take the shot? Okay. Um, at baseline, at baseline, 46.8% of policies were adopted. At midline, 82.1%, and at end line, 96.3%, which shows a significant improvement. And for uh, danger sensitive policies, 20.9, 70%, 80.7%, which means we're also able to achieve the target for the indicator. So we are now coming to the outcome indicators. So for the outcome indicators, as we indicated, this was the overall, this was what we were hoping to achieve. So male and female beginning teachers demonstrating core competencies in pre teacher teacher professional development and management, uh, and management policy framework. So if you look at the various components, use of strategies to open lessons, use of strategies to uh, provide clear explanations, so on and so forth. When we look at the findings, we see that TITO was able to achieve the targets for both male and female teachers for English and mathematics and even science, except for female science uh, tutors, sorry, beginning teachers, who had 21.6%, uh, though the expected target was 30%. So the next indicator, male and female beginning teachers demonstrating knowledge and application of basic school curriculum and assessment. So with this, we are looking for the use of strategies to provide clear explanations for new concepts, use of different teaching and learning materials, use of different interactive methods, so on and so forth. For this teacher also, teacher was able to achieve all its targets, except still for science female. They had 23.5%, though the target was 30%. And then indicator, um, indicator three, outcome indicator three, Percentage of male and female beginning teachers demonstrating gender sensitive strategies. So application of all teaching methods equally to male and female students, use of gender responsive strategies to challenge gender roles and gender norms, etc. For this indicator, the tool was not able to achieve any of its targets. So basically, this is the key, these are the key findings for the for the uh, for the project. Am I within time? I'm within time. Okay. Well, we've heard from Kuma. They are going to speak. Hello. You heard the presentation by Nkrumah, and I'm sure that you have some comments or questions to raise. Please, if you want to raise a question or make a comment, can you uh, let me see your hand, and then you tell us where you're coming from, and then you ask a question. Um, yes. Oh, okay. 
thank you very much. I'm Suleimana Adams, our chancellor, dean of Faculty of Education, UDS. Um, I want to know how you arrived at the percentages, or you determine them. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. With respect to the percentages, you realize that for each of the indicators, there were various components of the indicators. So, Titel, in collaboration with JMK, developed a rubrics that was used for the computation. So, for example, for the principal interviews, we asked the principal questions. And then we also ask similar questions to the, uh, to the college secretaries and also the quality assurance officers. And then we triangulate the results. So the rubrics that were developed, that was what we used throughout the period. So it was standardized across. So the rubrics combines all the questions, award points for the number of responses that are given by the, by the, by, by, by the principals and also the quality secretary. In the same way, for the tutors, we also had observation. Each observation had scores that were uh, assigned. So if a teacher, uh, uh, maybe in the classroom, shows some particular competency that is in line with what we are looking for, you, he is awarded that mark. So based on that, we made those computations. Thank you. OK, Mark uh, is a, com a kind of clarification. OK, uh, okay I am G. Brian James Grindo. Principal EP College of Education, Bimbula. Uh, the division of the numbers, the participants to female and male, uh, we know we, they are not of the same number. Uh, so could you share with us how you came by this? Basically, would I uh, even tell us the total number of uh, teachers if your interest was not there, but on the gender okay. issue? Basically, obviously, when you go to the colleges of education, the number of male tutors and female tutors are not the same. Even for the principals, number of male and female are not the same. But they were measured within the context. So out of all the female tutors, what was the proportion of those females who achieved the target? Please, I don't know if I'm, I'm clear. So basically, for example, we interviewed tutors. Maybe out of the 408 tutors that we interviewed, we had 300 male and then let's say 100 female. So the 100 female were evaluated within the context. Even in this case, it was within the subject. Male, uh, male science tutors and female science tutors. We take them as a whole and analyze and see what proportion of male science students achieve the target. What proportion of male uh, English tutors achieve the target. So they were computed as a group on their own. So it wasn't like we were trying to compare the results. So those are within, yeah. yeah. Thank you. I'm David Ayaba, principal, Boa College of Education in Pusiga. Uh, the last indicator where TTL uh, target was never made at all. Yes. Did you care to also find out or assign reasons to why that was not done? Because yeah. in all the previous ones, there were some significant successes. Mm -hmm. So what could have been the causes? Basically, one of the limitations for the, this study was that we didn't have a qualitative element in it. Currently, I'm sure if the principals are here, they are aware that we are currently conducting an annual assessment currently. But for this study, we had a full qualitative uh, uh, approach to it, both quantitative, just as we did, and a full qualitative. But so far, from our checks with the, with, the, with the classes, what we realized was that the mentors especially, so we realized across the gender component was not being achieved because in class, they do not exhibit those uh, competencies in class, whether consciously or unconsciously. So in discussions with Tito, they indicated that as part of their training, they, they always prompt them to be gender sensitive in their approaches. But it seemed that still, Though we've seen some progress, but we've still seen that there are still gaps in that sometimes when they go to the class to teach or to follow through with the curriculum, they, whether unconsciously or unconsciously, unconsciously, do not follow that. But what we are doing, as I said, for, for this assessment that we are doing for the, the current assessment, we are taking all that into consideration. We are having focus group discussions with the mentors and mentees. So naturally, all these issues will, will come up. So I'm sure in our next, our third, uh, meeting here, we'll be able to get the specific reasons for you.
Thank you so much. I'm uh, Yaqub Abdullahi, College Secretary, Gambaga College of Education. and uh, some of them use, use 100% in terms of getting the respondents. But uh, the, the figures are displayed. Can you please just tell us how you got some of the uh, figures as indicated? For basically... Because we had 40 colleges, we sampled all of them. For the principals, we used all of them. But for the, for the other targets, what we realized was that you, we, we had estimate, estimated number of tutors from TTL, for example, 929. So we use uh, stratification methods to be able to extract the required sample size at 95% significance that will be able to give us uh, 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 re, uh, results that are of statistical significance. So basically, that was how we approached it. So we use, we have the population, we select the sample that is, that is appropriate within the population. The sample size. So the sample size varied depending on the target. So for principals, we have 40 here. Uh, the college education tutors, 293. Student teachers, 2,930. I'm sure they are displayed there. So those were the samples that were selected and assessed. Prof, thank you very much. Um, I only want to find out if this didn't have effect on the gender sensitivity of uh, beginning teachers. Uh, um, please, work. please come again. Yes, I'm saying that. I just want to ask if this um, that is a outcome indicator two percentage of male and female beginning teachers demonstrating knowledge. Oh no, SPDA. Yeah, as indicator one rather, percentage of male and female beginning teachers demonstrating core competence in the P PTPDM and management policy framework. Yeah. If you look at the end line results, mm. you realize that apart from female under signs, yeah, the rest uh, had achieved their target. Exactly. Mm. However, when you come to the last, where beginning teachers' uh, sensitivity to gender issues, yeah. they have all not achieved. Yeah. So I want to find out if the usage of uh, the competencies in PTPDM policy, mm -hmm. having high achievement there, wouldn't have reflected on this data. Because uh, looking at the teacher professional development and the usage of this competence in the classroom, then we should feel that if here yeah, they woefully achieved at the end line, mm. it should reflect on their competencies in the PTPDM policy usage in the classroom. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, thank you very much. So you realize that for that indicator, the components that um, the component that were assessed were use of strategies to open lesson, use of strategies to provide clear explanations of, for new concepts and skills, use of different teaching and learning materials. But for the PTP that we evaluated here, didn't take gender sensitive uh, into account in the components. So the components were measured separately. Yes, the components were measured separately. That's why for that, that's why the fact that some of them showed uh, the use of techniques to address mixed abilities, and so on and so forth. But in terms of the gender aspect, we didn't have, though there was, there was a progress, there was progress, but the target that he tell set to achieve was not achieved. Yeah. Or unless, yes. Mm -hmm. Can I get that? In the PTPDM policy framework, we should consider 
gender issues highly within. Yeah. As this has become one of the core areas that the current curriculum is addressing. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Can we uh, applaud him for the presentation? Yes. Um, we're now moving to the next presenter. And uh, we have here. Um, the topic is uh, the new B. Ed curriculum and making of 21st century teachers in Ghana. UW student teachers, perception of students centered pedagogies. And this is going to be given by Dr. Munukum Richardson. Yeah. Richardson, you have 20 minutes presentation, 10 minutes uh, questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, good morning, uh, colleagues. Uh, for the opportunity to thank you for the opportunity to to present this work. In the spirit of uh, collaborative teaching and learning, uh, we are going to um, I'm going to present with my colleague uh, Vivian. And so Vivian is going to start us off, and then I will come in to continue. Thank you very much. Um. Um. Mr. Chairman, and ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'm highly honored to be here to present on our topic, the new beard curriculum and the making of 21st century teachers in Ghana, UEW students' um, perception of the student-centered pedagogies. Now we're focused on the student's perception because we have realized that most of in, in curriculum implementation, we usually focus on the end result, the outcome, but we've realized that the students are the touch bearers of the curriculum and there is the need to ask how they also feel about the curriculum. So the relevance of teachers in the education enterprise cannot be underscored. And we have realized that teaching in Ghana has remained relatively, has remained relatively um, the same over a long period of time. And we, are, we also know that teachers usually teach the way they were taught. So now we have the traditional teacher who bangs a lot of methods and content and then goes to the class and then just pour it on the pupils. And we all agree that this is not working for us. So we have the consensus to move away from this kind of teaching to see to the kind of teacher who is effective, engaging, inspirational, and fully prepared to teach the basic school curriculum in order to prove learning and um, outcomes. For this reason, there was the development of the national standards, the INTEF, and then the writing guide, which together culminated into the creation of the curriculum that will make the 21st century teacher who will possess all the characteristics that we look for. And these characteristics are teachers who are engaging, inspirational, teachers who are prepared, they have integrity, and they are very honest, and they will be able to bring the kind of outcomes that we desire in our learners. So prior to the um, full-fledged implementation of the curriculum, two departments of UEW began to try it ahead of its full-fledged imp implementation. After a semester long of implementation, we tasked our students to share their thoughts on the innovations that the new curriculum offered in their lecture halls. So, with the study, the approach was quantitative, descriptive survey, and then we used the census to select all the students that we taught in the basic education department and then the early childhood de department. We used um, questionnaire with 45 close-ended items, and then the analysis 
that we used was the descriptive statistics and some correlations. So from here, I'll leave the rest to my co-presenter. Thank you. So what did we find? Um, one significant uh, observation from this, um, the analysis we did was that the students were experiencing um, new teaching methodologies. We were happy to observe that our lecturers uh, were not treating it as business as usual, and they were actually implementing new methodologies as taught out in the curriculum. And so um, the responses you have there are the mean responses uh, from a, a range of one to five. And a 4.27, for example, is very significant, positive, um, um, overall rating uh, in terms of teachers, student teachers admitting that they were experiencing new teaching methodologies. Uh, group activity, they rated highly that their lectures were using them in group activity. The lecturers were allowing students to do independent research and they were moving away from the lecturer just teaching them everything. And the lecturer uh, were making individuals present in class, um, uh, which was not the norm. Uh, prior to the, the trial of, of this um, curriculum. So we saw that lecturers were embracing change and students were being given learning experiences with new uh, teaching strategies that they were not used to before. Um, we were particularly interested in the inclusion of ICT because it is a big issue um, with, with the, the 21st century skill required that we have technological skills. And with our present situation where a significant number of teachers are classified as uh, digital immigrants, we were interested in finding out how ICT use could be incorporated in the classroom. Uh, usually there's always a complaint of lack of um, resources. And, and so what our team there did was to try to innovate by using smartphones in the classroom. And we wanted to find out, even with that, how many of our students have access to smartphones because that could also become an impediment. And we were interested, we, we, we were very surprised to know that um, approximately 90% of our students had access to smartphones. It was only a small percentage of 10. 1% um, having it sometimes and then 9% no access to smartphone. Um, we we're not just excited by the 90%, we we're still interested in the 10% who were not having access to see uh, what could be a possible reason. And knowing that uh, research suggests that age has something to do with people's interest in use of technology, we wanted to correlate um, our findings and, and analyze to see whether age has something to do with it. And so we um, looked at the relationship between age and access and use to smartphone. And we observed that, yes, it was significant. Um, there was a relationship between age, there was a um, a significant negative correlation between access to smartphone and age, which means that um, at point five signif point zero five significance level, the older the student, the more likely they did not have access to smartphone, which is consistent with literature. But that also has implications for us moving forward with the implementation of the curriculum. And I'll be talking to that as we move along. Um, we were interested in finding out whether their use of smartphone in class has improved their skills in ICT. And we got very interesting results, um, a significant number, close to 85% of them either agreed or strongly agreed uh, to the question of whether the use of smartphone has improved their ICT uh, skills. And as I will uh, mention later on, um, they had, they were, they were taught how to search information and all of that, and they believed that that had improved their their use of ICT. And by extension, we believe they will be more excited to use it in the classroom when they eventually become teachers. Um, to the specific, for example, um, and tying that into self-directed learning, our students were interested, w reported. Um, we had we had significant results emanating from students self-directed learning. Uh, they admitted to being given the opportunity to learn by themselves and to look for information uh, by themselves. And so some of these variables um, showing skills in the use of browsers for internet search, um, 3.92 mean response is strong enough. Uh, they are more comfortable in the use of search engines now than they used to be, they used to, to be. 
uh, this, the announce section using unique terms to narrow down uh, to desired responses instead of the general usual, usual typing of everything in the, in the browser or the search engine and using particular search engines uh, that will give them more academic information um, such as Google Scholar and not the general uh, Google search. They were able to filter information retrieved to the ones that are more relevant to their need. And so these were all positive findings that we got. Um, challenges, yes, infrastructure challenges was the students mentioned that they had difficulty accessing internet, which is a big issue. Uh, the university has a Wi-Fi system, but it's not very reliable and strong. And so there was the infrastructure challenge. Um, they also had difficulty locating appropriate websites for information, um, which meant that even as lecturers, we still needed some CPD on how to help our learners to know more about how to search information. Um, interestingly, some students still prefer the lecture technique to activity-based learning, which we find very interesting. And maybe the contradiction that um, previously, uh, the person that came in the previous presentation, uh, this would be the, the response to that. Um, we were surprised that in spite of the students rating activity method highly, uh, a significant number of them, a mean of 3.62, still preferred lecture method, which we were not very sure about. And so this ambivalence they were demonstrating is giving us the indication that we need to do more research to find out why. And the next steps in our investigation will be investigating how this happened. Um, another challenge we saw was that some students, although we're happy with group work, also were mindful of the fact that it seems to have closed them down. Um, so they said they worked faster uh, when they were working alone. Um, and so sometimes they would prefer to work alone because they felt their groups were slowing them down. And we noticed that as a challenge to collaborative learning. It is, it is true, and we need to be mindful of, of this. So um, moving forward, what are the lessons that we have learned? One, future lecturer commitment is key. There are these challenges, but if we are interested in making it work, there are ways to do that. Um, in integrating ICT, we should be mindful of the demographic. As we are looking at the age and the access to smartphone and use of smartphone, uh, we need to be mindful that the class is diverse. And so we should look at necessary accommodations for those who are not very comfortable with ICT, who might eventually slow the faster ones uh, down. Uh, logistical issues remain a challenge, internet connectivity, large class size. And so moving forward in um, come October for the full full scale implementation, we should be making arrangements to address some of these challenges. Um, mixed ability um, of learners ought to be managed well. Um, group work works as we were told and as we, we presented earlier, um, but it ought to be managed well, making sure that you have mixed ability groups and not just one-sided type of groups. But even in the management, some of the students complain, student teachers complain of being slowed down, which means uh, the, the faster ones ought to, you have to have a way of managing the situation so that they don't feel disadvantaged. And then the ambiguity in the responses about students, teachers still preferring lecture method is something that is of interest to us that we are going to go further with the qualitative part of the uh, investigation that we are doing. So in a nutshell, these are the initial findings we are getting from the students in respect to the implementation of the new curriculum. And thank you very much for your audience. Well, thank you very much. Um, please, your comments and questions. Thank you very much. Um, my first question has to do with uh, policy regulating the use of cell phones in basic education that is from KG through to senior high school. Um, from your presentation, we saw 90% access, but the issue of usage as a problem. Do you have any correlation between these policy issues that is inhibiting the access? That is the first point. Uh, my second question.
question has to do with uh, the integration. If this integration also has something to do with the policies that is making it that the integration is also not going there. I think when you finish with it, then I'll come with my comment. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, in terms of the policy, we will not be able to, we will not be able to, okay, let me put it this way. Okay. Yes, the policy is there for the uh, lower level, but at the university, there's no restriction. Um, we are also mindful of the fact that we all have the negatives associated with ICT integration, and, and people feel strongly about that. But what we are seeing here is giving us clues and probably suggesting to policymakers to begin a rethink of the policy and see how we can harness the potential uh, instead of looking at the negatives associated with it. And what we were thinking was that maybe we could, instead of infrastructure setting up computer labs and stuff, we could um, invest in providing smartphones that are customized for education purposes for our youth in our classrooms as the way to go instead of the blanket no to smartphones because it could be, as we are saying, it could be the reason why some people still do not have access at the university. But there's no restriction on use of smartphones at, smartphone at the university. Although it's not, it's not generally, we, we consciously made students bring their smartphone to class, but generally before this, they will be told, keep your smartphones away. But for the purposes of this curriculum, we made them bring it because it's a necessity. <laughs> oh, uh, firstly, I'd like to say that I think it's absolutely superb that you're doing this kind of work at Winneba, which will be really, really useful when the other universities begin to pick up the new BEd curriculum. I think it's stunning, and I want to know much more about it. The second thing is, I think the observations around independent work versus group work versus lectures, I don't think it's one or the other or the other. I think it's about making decisions about what's the most appropriate methodology for the content you're teaching. Yeah. Um, I think when it comes to, oh, I prefer lectures, that can be quite interesting because in a lecture situation, it's easier to be invisible, it's easier to disengage, it's easier if you're shy, it's easier if you haven't, uh, haven't done the preparation. Um, what is the, just the final point, I'm very interested in the notion of mixed ability groups in teacher education yeah. in Ghana. And I wonder, can you say anything about what the implications for that might be for the students who are put, a, put into the lower ability group amongst the group of student teachers? Thank you very much. Yeah, actually, when um, we were doing the groupings, because uh, we had this large number of students, we were not able to put them into their specific ability groups. But what we did was um, we had their index numbers from 1 to 520, and we grouped them according to the index numbers. So we have 1 to 10, 11 to 20, um, 21 onwards in groups of 10. But it was the outcome of the um, research that has brought to fore that kind of um, ability, the need to consider the ability group. So I'm sure um, in going forward, we will look at how to make that work, especially when we look at the correlation between access to smartphone and age. So when that happens, the next time we are going to look at the age of the student teachers and then we will mix them with other groups who are, are very, who have the good access and they have the skills so that they will help them to come up with it. Vivian, Thank that's you. exactly, Viv, Vivian, is it Vivian? Yeah. That's exactly the response because you're talking about more confidence being able to support the less confident, rather than putting all the least confident into a group. Spot on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, excuse me. Please. Uh, pardon. Uh, car number GT25-09. You are needed right here. Yeah. The 
Yeah, the, the comments part of the preaching and acts. I think the settings in the universities are different from the colleges and the partnership schools. The basic free school has restriction not to bring phones to the school. But we know learning technology goes with the tools. And here is the case. We want to create technology corner. And if the child asks the parent, today I'm going to study something at school, I need a cell phone, he will not be given. So it's only the teacher or the student teacher only has access to the phone. So this policy actually is inhibiting the use. That's why we have the access. Exactly. And what actually we look at is the phobia of the use of the cell phones. So we think too much of the negativity of the use of the cell phones in our teaching and learning environment. But you can all bear with us that we were all brought up from our parents or mother's kitchen. And we do have the knife there. But we were told how to handle the knife yes. so that it may not cut us. So we are looking at the cell phone as a knife in the kitchen. If parents can guard against and give good uh, guidance and um, ways of protecting themselves, the cell phones can be very good too that we can use to enhance education so that the, out the, 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 the negativity or the phobia of its negatively used can be kept. That is the comment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, yes, I think this is a very important point. Um, the government uh, cannot provide all the ICT tools that it needs in a school community. within that uh, uh, framework, within that uh, uh, venue, that is restricted to study only children here. You can go beyond that. Yes, it is restricted to schools here, but those schools do not close for those schools. So thank you very much. Can we clap for thank the you. presenters? Thank you, Prof. I welcome my audience to this presentation as about a reflective practice. So we are trying to re reflect on our practices in and out. So reflecting in practice and reflective on practice. Uh, I think uh, when we are looking at um, issue of uh, assessing mentoring practices in selected partnership schools in teacher education at Kru East District of Ghana. Basically, we want to find out what we are not doing right. And I am looking at a model 
where we are fetching water into a basket which we continue to pour I'm also looking at another model which is constructing an arc using the same radius definitely we we'll get the same circumference but when we change the radius we get different arc and a different circumference what are these principles telling us we are doing the work training teachers in the classroom student teachers of course putting in all our efforts to make sure that the newly researched methodologies pedagogies learning styles go into the basic education but what are we seeing when we go in and evaluate we are not seeing the results so we have to reflect on our practice in and on to see what is going wrong this necessitated this study over the years um, we find out that many efforts that we put into training our student teachers to go on to the field they end up in the hands of a very good stakeholder in the education quality education that is the mentors so how do the mentors continue with what we have started at the colleges you could see that all the efforts we put in when the student get into the partnership schools have to be continued but when you go in you see a disparity in what we have taught them and what they are using on the field starting from of observing and looking at their lesson notes, how they prepare it, how detailed are they when you compare it to when you, they were at college. All these issues are informing the reasons behind the mentoring practices that our students go through in the partnership schools. So the first research question that comes to mind here was, what are the barriers to effective use of college education best practices in basic education? Why new best practices are not making the necessary impact in some selected partner schools in Kweu East of Ghana? Which action research interventions can be used as a treatment to this solution? The methodology employed here the research design used was action research and the population the entire population of the research consists of uh, stakeholders in the partnership schools found in the Kiwi east of eastern region of ghana particularly abetifi the stakeholders were put into seven categories namely circuit supervisors newly entrants in-service teachers, pre-service teachers, pupils, college supervisors, and lead mentors, and classroom mentors. What were the sampling and sampling procedures? Out of the seven categories, a total of four categories were selected to this study. The number present, or the number comprises of circuit supervisors, college supervisors, lead mentors, and classroom mentors, purposive sampling technique was used to select the sample size. And according to literature, Cohen, Manion, and Morrison 2005 said that the sampling, the researcher handpicks the cases to be involved on the basis of judgment. This means that the researcher used his own procedure of judgment to select a sample of the categories. This can also be learned or termed as judgmental sampling. 
the research instruments employed in this study were questionnaires, interviews, observations to gather the data. Summary. Why the best practices are not making the necessary impact in basic education? Information gathered from the table one in the study indicated that there is a well-known slogan in the teaching field which reads, teaching for money and teaching for marks. These two slogans, teaching for money and teaching for marks. About 38.5% about which represent five out of the 13 lead mentors confirmed that there was indeed a slogan like that in the teaching field. Whilst table three indicates that the slogan is having low impact on basic education with most lead mentors disagreeing. Table two also made it clear with the highest percentage that the slogan is having high impact in basic education. Questioning and reflecting on professional practice. Another literature, which we can say, there are many studies which have shown that teachers are not given opportunities to question their professional practice. Underwood, 1997. Once teachers have finished that initial training, they do not expect the need for much further training, therefore do not take initiative to improve their practice and learn. New best practices or methods either from in-service teachers, mentees, or offering an upgrading course. Desfox 1995 also say in his literature, review of the shift from novice to expert teachers found that many teachers are perfectly well satisfied with their practices, which they copied from all staff during mentorship and in-service training, and unlikely to question the prevailing educational processes. In regard to all knowledge, we can speculate that the impact of new experiences, that is, the best practices, will be severely attenuated if it is in conflict with teachers' basic ontological categories. Examples, their beliefs about nature of the job, the nature of childhood. Therefore, if teachers see no need to change or question their current professional practice, they may not accept the use of new current practices or methods in teaching. What attitudinal and behavioral changes must be prescribed for mentoring or mentoring practices or processes? We realize that some attitudes and behavior must be prescribed for mentors in mentoring processes in order to enhance effective use of best current practices in teaching and learning in basic education. From table four, it was identified with the highest percentage that most lead mentors mostly agree that the statement relies on the use of best current practices as taught in college is in pre-service practice is mentors and mentoring problem. Relax on them. We also realize that the means mentors, this means that mentors should be hardworking and not relax on the use of best current practices for preschool, for pre-service teachers to also imitate. Mentors in mentoring process are also to assist in changing the slogan in the teaching field to promote the use of current and the best practices in basic education during in-service practices. Mentors should also adapt and adhere continuously to the learning to learn current college teaching methods from mentees. What are the conclusions? Mentors should not continue to assume that mentees, that is intense, and all others in mentoring or mentorship partnership are coming to them with no good current teaching methodologies in pedagogies or andragogy. However, 
They are rather helping them to practicalize the new things learned and skills acquired in management of the learning environment from them. If this perception is, 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 is assumed, then I think we are making a headway. In addition, currently, Transforming Teacher Education and Learning, TTEL, is coming on with new teaching and learning improving methods across all the colleges in the country. So if this new perception is adopted, change in attitude and behavior, then it can make a headway. If care is not taken, all these will be thrown overboard. As had been observed, mentors must open up to learn the newly researched methodologies of teaching and learning. It is only by these interventions that the newly researched teaching methods can get into the classrooms in a basic education for development of human capital assets for the country, like likewise ours. These mentees, intense and newly entrants must be used as coaches after induction and orientation with them. Thank you for your audience. Oh, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> that's raised some issues. Can we have your Thank you very much for an insightful um, presentation. But Mr. Bunny, I'm still waiting for the tables. I didn't see them. Yeah. <laughs> um, I thought I they were going to come, but okay. in any case, yeah. if you can show them, that would be good. However, I wanted to know how you derived the um, slogans, the two slogans. How do you write those? Teaching for money? And teaching for marks. And teaching for marks. Is it coming from some qualitative data from the study? Or anyway, I give you the floor to respond. Yeah. Uh, I actually, okay. Uh, should please, should I react to the question? Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. The the tables are there, but because of the number of slides limitation for this presentation, it has not been added to it. But I have the tables in there which I can provide for you. Coming to the slogan, when you go out for supervision and you closely pay attention to the student teachers, when they are in the college, they say they, they are teaching for marks. So what are whatever rudiment, whatever best practices, developing TLMs and everything, they'll be up to it. They will do everything to your appreciation, 100%. But when they move from the college system and get into the classrooms, and for that matter, the first contact is the partnership schools when they are on mentorship. There, if you are going for supervision, you see, see the 100% behavior. But immediately, they become newly entrant. They are on the field. They go to the classrooms. Now they are teaching for money. They are not teaching for max. So it means that reduce or relax on the college best practices and do what is happening there. Follow the status quo, what is happening there. You can prepare lesson notes that is very scanty. You can go without maybe TLMs, less not advanced preparation because this time we are teaching for money. So the best practices that have been taught in college are not adhered when they move to become newly entrant. And the people who are supposed to do this supervision is the lead mentors. So when they relax on the supervision, we don't get the outcome there. This is where the slogan is coming from. Yeah, um, then that should have been your topic. You see, um, we are learning. I'm learning, you are learning, and if we don't correct ourselves, we'll make a lot of mistakes. Your presentation, there was no interaction at all. 
you see, you were reading, like, you see, that is why we call PowerPoint. You need to project your font size to a minimum of 30, 32, so that those of us sitting out here could read your font. And you put a whole lot of things there. It should be six bullet points per slide, please. And what you put out there, we couldn't read it here. I'm saying it with humility, so that when you go in international conferences, they are going to uh, kill you there, okay? Because you need to look and do interaction, okay? And if you know you're, you can't put any uh, table there, do not mention it at all, okay? Because you're a PhD student, that's why I'm uh, saying this. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Mine is a general comment, not necessarily to him specifically, but with the question of mentors, mentors I'm, I'm wondering whether the problem is not with how they get recruited in the first place. Um, I'm happy with the new frame, the framework for uh, uh, the NCAF, which is now talking about um, commitment to life, uh, lifelong learning as a, as a, um, a cross well, scale, a scale to be developed whilst in school. Because I think the challenge has been a lot of our teachers who believe once they are done with college, then they are done learning. And so when you are bringing new things, they are just going to oppose it. And we're having a discussion about some of our colleagues who still require and expect that teachers will go and divide the board into three, write the date on the right-hand side and not the left-hand side. There are still colleagues like that. But I believe it's because they are not committed to lifelong learning and they don't want to. But interestingly, some of these people get recruited as mentors. And that is why I'm throwing in the question, is it not how we get the mentors selected? Um, maybe we should be looking out for those who are ready to learn and then recruit them as mentors. But if we are just going to go by head teacher's recommendation or by our friends and whatever, then we are likely to have the problem that you are bringing up. Thanks. Thank you for the contribution. I am Demis from the Ethiopian delegation. Thank you very much for your uh, presentation. What uh, I just wanted to ask is about what is meant by action research. As you know it very well, there are three important types of research. One is the basic one, the other is the applied one, and the other one, the local one. In the local type of research which you have mentioned, and which is related to mentoring, there should be a problem identified and uh, directed to what is being solved, okay? Essentially, action, this research is different from other types of research because it involves not only recommendation, but doing the recommendation and reporting results as part of the efforts that you continuously make to improve your practice. Therefore, it is a, t a kind of research conducted by teachers themselves studying their practices, identifying their problems, finding our solutions, and implementing the solutions, and finally going, going, going. And what is expected of action research? And what kind of measures have you taken in order to improve the practice? Thank you very much. This is my question. Yeah. Thank you very much. Exactly as you said, treatment intervention. So after the sessions, we go back. If you could, you could see the, I don't know whether there's the pictures there. The first was when we collect the data. When they realize their practices, the shortfall of the practice, their practices, the recommendations and suggestions, 
we sent back the same questionnaire to them as a treatment. And they now realize that, yes, they fall short of this and they have improved. So the mentors all realize that they have to go back and pick up and do, use their best college practices in the mentoring process. You deal with the issues in the, in the system, and then you try and find out how to change the situation, you know, and then report to But I think the, you know, when you started, you were talking about reflection, and I thought you were going to talk about reflection, and then action research came, and so many things came in, you know. Uh, so the focus was not, you know, directly on what you were doing. And then there should be clarity in, in what we Thank you, Prof. Thank you very much. Uh, like somebody said, you did a slogan teaching for money. But I remember it. when I was teaching, in, when we were teaching years back, we were having a split rate division and supervision. We don't leave everything in the hands of mentors or elite mentors and the rest. So if we have this perpetrate division to go around to see whether they are using the TLMs and the rest, I think we'll see that we taught, some of us taught, we didn't teach for money, we taught for, and uh, we're happy we were teachers and we wanted to impact to students. So I'm uh, appealing to the education service or whatever. If you compare the public school to the private schools, the best teachers are in the public schools, but bad results, zero percent. When you go to the private schools, they are all SHS leavers. And they do their best because of inspection and supervision. If that thing is lacking, you can do everything, and then education will still continue to suffer for lack of supervision. So we have to intensify the supervision in the school so that the students will do the right thing they are expected to do to teach uh, what ELM, they go to school on time, they do that. We can leave all those things on the shoulders of the mentors and the rest. So what are the responsibility of the head teachers? and the second supervisors, and everybody should be up and doing. And number two, you asked a question on uh, using the use of mobile phones before you came here. So I saw that your background was ICT. But uh, principals who went to UK, Leicester, and Cambridge University, when we went, we saw that even a student in the so how many parents can buy mobile phones to their children from uh, Crunch to uh, P1 to... I think the best we saw was that some of them were using tablets and computers. Yes, yeah, so if we can intensify the use of uh, computers or this thing, but buying mobile phones for all our kids, I think some of them will even play with it more than learning with it. Because at their age now, uh, I don't think they can control the use of mobile phone. So that's my contribution. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bali, thank you very much for the presentation. And I think Madam has said it all. On your slogan, Maybe you could use that as an, another area of topical issue you can look at, so that you look at the specific aspect of their teaching. Make sure they can implement the new system we are putting in place to help have the quality uh, teaching and learning process. And with your action research issue, I think you are trying to hide behind the fact that the students have been taught how to teach, and maybe they are not
not implementing it. So upon your research question, they would now realize. But once you are doing the action research, then you should try and find an interventory um, activity, something that you would put in place for them to practice or to have a hand on, so that they will use to improve upon the uh, quality teaching you are talking about. So the way you look at it, that's why you have this kind of problem. Your questionnaire, yes, it has given you or it has established that they are lacking something. But then what did you, at the middle, do before the next uh, administration of your research question? That's what I think you are lacking. So maybe if you can put that in place, it will help you very well. Thank you very much. Thank you, too. Okay. Uh, my name is Rhoda. I work with UNICEF. In your presentation, you mentioned that when you, you realize that when the student teachers go to the schools, um, whatever they learn there, they don't implement. I think it goes to buttress what the earlier colleagues have said, that maybe you need to do a deeper dive to find out why they do not implement. What is the environment like? And they are not doing that. I'm also pleading with you that whatever outcomes you have, you also share with um, the National um, Curriculum um, Assessment Center, NACA, because currently, as it is, they are also revising the curriculum for the pre-tertiary level. And so some of these findings will help shape the curriculum and then intense supervision at the pre-tertiary level. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for the presentation. I can see you put a lot into it. But I have a very simple advice, and I'm still going back to the two slogans. Uh, teaching for money. And teaching for marks. And teaching for marks. It has very serious implications. And I think uh, when we haven't done scientific research, I think what you, those slogans, I can see you know, you came by them from your perception of your own students. You have, you have not really conducted any scientific research to arrive at that. And I think uh, it has serious implications and uh, we have to be very careful about such uh, statements. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all. Um, the, this research was anchored from the DBE program into the BEAD program now. Okay. The, the BEAD program is having what we are calling supported teaching in schools. So our fear now is that if this approach in the DBE program continues into the BEAD program, then the successes may not be there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you give a clap of Well, I just want to remind all of us that uh, we have a new curriculum that we are operating now. And then uh, next uh, October, we have the other curriculum being uh, in, in, uh, implemented. Um, some of the issues that have been raised here are issues that have been covered in the curriculum. You know, and uh, training processes are going on to ensure that people are prepared to implement the new curriculum. And apart from that, the ministry also has put into place you know, an accountable system, a new national inspectorate board that will really ensure that all the various stakeholders and actors you know, are performing their, their functions you know, uh, efficiently. You no, know, there are other measures that have been put in place to ensure that, and policies and so on, to really make sure that uh, the new curriculum and the new uh, educational transformation that is taking place in the country, you know, uh, takes place. So, um, uh, it's interesting what we have discussed here. Uh, so many issues have been raised. But it's interesting that yesterday we were also talking about 
you know, um, ensuring interactive learning in the classroom and making sure that uh, this really takes root. And then we're also talking about, so if you're going to do that, do we, should we have lecture rooms? Because when you have lecture rooms, you are going to lecture. Do we have a new name called learning space? So that it's a learning space that you have created for the uh, students and teachers to interact. So that it's not labeled lecture. So that that traditional way of presentation you know, could then be minimized. But I pray to all of you, you know, that you should be thinking of.